Hello, my name is Kenneth Anderson, and I'm going to be talking to you about stakeholder analysis and communications plan. This is uh, directly applicable to uh, project management and also entrepreneurial startups. Uh, to start off, the stakeholder analysis has three steps. We start off by defining a goal, identify who the stakeholders are, and then what their interests are. The goal that you identify needs to be a clear and very specific goal. Generally, this is built, uh, this is identified through the project charter process. If you have multiple goals, uh, you need to develop a stakeholder analysis around each of those independent goals. There may be some overlap between the different goals, but you're going to pick out, uh, see that some stakeholder groups are going to be affected by one goal and not the other goal. So you need to start off as a foundation for this having a very specific goal. Now the stakeholders are di identified or defined as anyone that may be impacted by the project. There are those that may have a direct impact and those that may have be impacted indirectly. Uh, also there are what, what are called silent stakeholders. So for instance, if there is an environmental remediation or there's mining or logging going on in an area, um, then a silent stakeholder might be an endangered species that could derail or bring the entire project to a halt. So we need to, as you're doing the stakeholder analysis, try and identify um, who's impacted directly and indirectly, but also um, if there are any silent stakeholders available. Now I do want to caution about trying to go too far and stretch too much about indirect impact um, because you could say, yeah, I sneezed and then I gave a cold to one person who passed it on to them and then I affected the President of the United States. That's, that's way too far um, out, of, out of stretch, but if you, if, if you go back to the goal, you can always use the goal as a reference point about how far to go or what, how far the impact is that you want to evaluate. <clears throat> so once you, uh, once you have identified these stakeholders, and I, I generally recommend that when you're uh, creating a list of the stakeholders that you, uh, you work in a team or work with somebody and you can uh, generate ideas or collaborate with somebody and come up with um, a much more substantial list of stakeholders that might be impacted than generally if you work by yourself. And this will go for also identifying the interests uh, and try and work in a team or in a group to come up with, um, with them. And also recognize that you can continue to add uh, people to your stakeholder list as you continue to progress in your project or your startup and list out other people that may be impacted. <clears throat> so once you have a, a good list going, then you can start to look at their interests and uh, ask the question, why do they care? How would they be impacted by this project? One thing that I've always noticed is that money is almost always an interest for the different stakeholders. So you should look at, is their revenue going to be affected? So you should include competitors. How might a competitor uh, react um, to that interest or the success or failure of the project? So uh, as they say, money, you know, you can trace it back to uh, the interests or the parties. So if you ever have any questions, money is a good uh, <clears throat> way to track interests in a project. Uh, there might be emotional factors. For some groups, there are very hot issues that are very emotionally charged. Uh, and so these are the, those interests, whether they're um, no matter what, they need to be taken into consideration. Uh, and then perceptions. Uh, perception is reality. And so w you need to take into uh, to account the perceptions that people or stakeholders may have relative to a project. Whether or not they're real, uh, take them into consideration and you need to honor them because this will help you in the communications plan or to help manage those, those expectations and interests better. 
So for an example, uh, we're going to be putting together a stakeholder analysis, and uh, we're going to start with spent foundry sand. Uh, first off, uh, foundries, what they do, if you're casting anything in metal or steel, uh, you generally use the same process. Uh, right here I have a picture of two fish. The top fish is a wooden fish, and the bottom fish is one that has been cast in iron or steel. And what they generally do is they create a mold out of sand, and uh, they may press in or build the, the, the mold around maybe that wooden fish on the top, and then remove the wooden fish, and then they'd be able to pour molten... Uh, molten metal into the the impression and then they would be able to shake away the sand. Now the benefit is that uh, you can do much more complex molds and trying to remove uh, a hard metal object out of a hard mold just doesn't work very well. So they've created a process with sand and over time the sand wears down and it doesn't hold its shape as well or hold the detail of the, the targeted cast as well, and then it becomes spent. So on the right side, you see this big pile of black sand, and that is spent foundry sand. Uh, and so we, <coughs> spent foundry sand uh, is used in several different ways. It's sometimes used as, uh, in asphalt road paving or as fill or it's used in landfills as a cover material. Uh, generally, uh, some foundries uh, may have uh, big open areas that they can dump their foundry sand into and just create a waste uh, holding place in, in their backyard. Not all foundries can do that. Smaller foundries have to uh, dispose of it as they produce it. So we, uh, we were evaluating this, uh, the foundries, the spent foundry sand, as, and asked, can it be reused in landscape and horticulture? So we, were, we won a grant with the US EPA uh, for Region 5 to evaluate the potential of using, reusing spent foundry sand. Uh, <clears throat> so we created a list of uh, different stakeholders who may have an interest in the project. You can see ourselves, and this work was done with the Ohio State University researchers, uh, the grant funding agency, uh, landscapers and users, golf courses, soil blenders, uh, uh, some competitors, associations or societies, uh, and then sand dealers, a distributor, we needed to evaluate that, foundries themselves, and then uh, where does the sand come from, a sand quarry or sand miners? Uh, and then there are neighbors of foundries who are also impacted by the potential reuse of foundry sand. So we're going to go through some of the interests of some of these groups. It would take too long to go through each of them. But as we go through the these that I've selected, you'll start to see some... Uh, some competing interests between the different stakeholders. So foundries, generally they've had to pay to have this foundry sand hauled off and disposed at at a landfill. And so if there was a way for them to give it away and have maybe a landscaper come and pick it up, then they wouldn't have to pay for those disposal or trucking fees. So they would be able to reduce their costs and be able to save money. Or if they were able to even charge these landscapers to or soil blenders to get the foundry sand, then they might find a new source of income. So this made it very attractive to some of the different foundries. For the grant funding agency, Region 5 EPA, uh, they have an interest in balancing protection of the environment and public health with while encouraging reuse of materials. So the recycle, reduce, reuse, they were interested in supporting that effort. <clears throat> they also had an environmental stewardship responsibility that they needed to manage. And while this is considered industrial waste, it 
didn't, it doesn't have any heavy metals, but they would have to be responsible for permitting it uh, or doing any permitting associated with it. So they had an interest in the reuse of spent foundry sand. Landscapers, on the other hand, would be able to maybe save some money through cost management. Um, they would, if they were able to get the sand for free, they would be able to use it in some of maybe their soil mixes or use it in some of the hardscape if they were putting some uh, brick down in somebody's backyard or as a patio or they could use it as fill. There's also um, appearances and performance of inputs. So this sand being black, in contrast to the tan sand that they generally would get, uh, they have an extra benefit for some of the different, their customers being able to sell it for a little bit more because of its unique nature. Now, one of the other things is that this has an odor uh, that may be unpleasant or smell chemically so some of their customers may disapprove of that smell or be concerned because of the smell. So they, these landscapers also had customers that they needed to be concerned about. Landfills, on the other hand, they had an interest in trying to still get paid to collect the, the spent foundry sand. Uh, by law, they are required to cover garbage after so many feet or inches of landfill that they acquire that they have to put a, a layer of dirt over it. Um, and so spent, uh, spent foundry sand was a naturally a good source or a good free um, cover uh, material for that. Uh, but diverting that out of landfills, they might be able to extend the life of the landfill. Uh, so whether they're increasing their revenue uh, by accepting it or whether they're extending the life of the landfill, uh, these may uh, have different interests depending upon each landfill. And uh, each landfill may have uh, use it for different reasons. The, uh, the neighbors of foundries also may have had an interest. Uh, as far as not in my backyard, they may not like having the foundry next to them uh, because the foundry, it's an industrial uh, place and it's dirty. So one of the things that uh, these neighbors may have issue with is if the foundry is taking a, sh a scoop load of this spent foundry sand and dumping it into trucks, there's a dust cloud that's created and they have the perception that it's industrial waste uh, and may perceive that it has heavy metals because it's used in steel and iron castings. And whether that's true or not is up for debate and testing, but it may perception is reality. But this dust may float over the fence and get their homes dirty or or you know cause other other concerns about them breathing in the dust. So the neighbors of the foundry would have an, an issue if the foundry kicked up more dust than the normal. So right here I want to point out is, uh, is the format for the stakeholder analysis. And generally I do this in Excel. It's easier to manage it. But I start off with the goal at the top because I always want to come back to that goal as I'm defining out who the stakeholders are and what their interests are so that I don't stray too far away from the goal. But you can see the stakeholders are listed down the left-hand side and their interests are uh, in, the, in the right column. But then what I've also been able to do is you, can, is you work on this and develop this further, you'll be able to create groups that have similar interests. So the end users with the maybe golf course builders, landscapers, uh, landfills, they may have some similar interests. The sales and distribution between soil blenders and sand dealers, they may have some similar interests. So as you do this, you can organize it and develop this uh, a bit more. And this leads us to the communications plan. Now, one of the great things about a communications plan is now that you've recognized who all of your stakeholders are and what their interests are, 
then you can uh, start managing perceptions or start managing these stakeholders in different ways. Uh, and it can be used to build a marketing plan so that you can interface with the different groups more effectively. Uh, maybe create some buzz around the activity that you're doing and uh, start to make some inroads into that industry or that marketplace. Uh, the communication plan also evaluates the frequency of communications. How, so how often do you need to relay information to them or keep them updated with your progress? What information do you need to share? So you base this on, according to their interests, what, they, what part of the information, because not every stakeholder needs to know everything that's going on. So if we go back to this stakeholder analysis, we can see that uh, the Ohio State University researchers, um, they, they may be interested in uh, how update, regular updates uh, to the progress of our project on spent foundry sand. Whereas in contrast, sand dealers or soil blenders, they just may want the final report. They also have a preferred communication form of communication, which may be an email, a phone call, an association newsletter, webinars, or there are many other ways to communicate or interact with different groups, whether it's social media or um, even, even recorded uh, <coughs> video presentations like this. And then one of the most important things is what is the expected result that you want to get out of that stakeholder group? How do you want them to react? How do you want to influence them? By defining that, you're setting a goal for how you want that group to react, whether you want them to promote your product or whether you want them to talk about your product and create buzz or talk about your project. Uh, so this really evaluating and creating a communications plan can also reduce marketing expenses by, by being able to tie into uh, different associations and share news and updates or leverage uh, public affairs by interacting with the media and having the media carry out your your news of interest. So <clears throat> right here is our, uh, as you can see, we've taken our stakeholder analysis and we've built upon it with some additional columns. So you have your stakeholders on the left and then your interests right there. But in the middle, we've got our frequency and what we need to communicate, uh, whether it's a weekly update or a quarterly update or just their final report. Uh, we've also identified communication preference. Do we send them an email? Um, this is a, a great way to identify who opinion leaders are within, the, within those uh, areas of industry or within those market sectors. Okay. Uh, communication preference, if you look uh, at the row of golf course builders, you can see that there's the Sense Show, which is uh, an Ohio uh, nursery and landscape show that many golf course uh, people attend, or OTF, the Ohio Turfgrass Foundation, uh, that many of these industry people attend. Also, you can see the expected results whether we, uh, we want to help fill out permits or increase use of foundry sand or used foundry sand, we, uh, we can start to say this is, this is the goal and where we want this stakeholder group to move towards. So I'm going to leave this with you, and uh, I hope this is helpful in thinking through some of the details of your project or your, your startup. Thank you.